This is Ken Boev with Reflections, and I'm welcoming my guest for the first time, uh, Cameron McAllister. And I'm so thrilled that you have joined our, our, our happy band and that you are going to be, I have the privilege of working together with you. And I think uh, you have a wonderful capacity for art and the bigger aesthetic side, the right brain side. That, uh, that draws me to you, and yet you're also, I think, a very skilled apologist, apologist so that you have the, the mind and the heart that puts that together. And this is one of the things I, I, lo I love to see in a person, an integrated self. Well, thank you very much, Ken. It's, it's an honor to be here and to work with you, and I'm actually really looking forward to this chat about the imagination. Imagination. Ah. Yeah, so I'm wondering, Ken, just, it has been my experience whenever I talk about the imagination, and I've done so in a number of settings, immediately there's a kind of suspicious mood <laughs> yeah. that fills the room. And so, because I think the assumption is for a lot of people, imagination is synonymous with fantasy. We're now detached from reality and we want to actually deal with the world as it is. Yes. So I'm wondering if we can begin maybe by talking about what the imagination actually yes, is. Yes, it's good because I think as we know, many of the things that we've developed in our recent technologies have diminished the imagination. Mm. People had a better opportunity to use the mind's eye when they heard a radio play, a radio story, because they were not seeing it. It wasn't just fed to them, but rather they could use their imagination. But that said, however, you and I are lovers of film, and so that also brings us into that. But sometimes uh, the narrative is controlled, I fear, by the idea of fantasy rather than imagination. There's a big difference, isn't there? In your own experience, how do you distinguish fantasy from imagination? Yeah, well, I'm going to rip off a really a great thinker here who I, th I think you're familiar with as well, Ken. But Malcolm Geit yes, yes. had a book come out a number of years ago. He's actually written quite extensively on yes, the imagination. Yes. But he had a book called Faith, Hope, Poetry. And he, in that book, defines the imagination as an active power of perception. And he actually calls it the, the sort of the twin of reason, mm. because it is part of how we piece the world together mm -hmm. and actually make sense of it. So this works in conjunction with the way C.S. Lewis defines the imagination. I think he says reason is the natural organ of truth. But imagination is the organ of meaning. Yes, yes. So it's a powerful image, isn't it? Yeah. So the way the way I've kind of looked at it is fantasy in the negative sense, in the pejorative sense. So I'm not talking about so technically Lord of the Rings is fantasy, and I think we would agree it's a wonderful achievement. Yes. That's not a bad thing. But fantasy, I think, as people mean it in the negative sense, has to do with escapism. Yes. Yes. Right. So getting away from the world. Think of somebody who becomes completely and totally addicted to a video game, for instance, yeah, that's right. to try to escape from their circumstances. So that's fantasy in the negative sense. Yes. But imagination has to do with how we make sense of the world right. and our place in the that's, world. That's right. Um, uh, your dad and I, Stuart uh, McAllister, were, were talking about how affection is the organ of desire and how imagination is the organ of meaning and how a reason is the organ of reality as we're kind of describing it. So it's an interesting way of seeing it uh, that you want to have imagination because that gives us meaning, but you'd never want to disconnect it from the whole area of reason, the or origin of reality, because reality, though we begin to discover biblical reality is far rich, more rich and more robust than anything we ourselves can invent. Yes. Yeah, I think it's the temptation, especially where, I mean, we're all people living in the modern world. And the temptation is to think, of course, that we have an exhaustive understanding of reality. But of course, what will quickly cure that, mm -hmm. is, as you know, Ken, will be just dig into reality a little bit. Yes. And you quickly find that it's so rich, it's so vast, it completely exceeds your full grasp. And that's not a reason to panic. That's only a reason, that's only a reason to panic if you want total control. Yeah, that's correct. That would be the loss, the terror, the fear that I no longer know what's my best interest and how to get there. I'm totally out of control. I'm I'm lost in the cosmos, as Walker Percy would yes. put it, drifting away, or like a message in a bottle, though, which are another image of poet of Walker Percy. The idea of there's is there a message though that has actually come across the seas and gives us actually a true north, a narrative that transcends our earthbound mm -hmm. imaginations. Our 
or earthbound machinations to try mm-hmm. to control and understand because at the end of the game it's a day it's all thin it's in comparison with biblical revelation with a vision of the wellspring of beauty goodness and truth our imaginations are really in my mind controlled by the the things below it's it's actually a kind of a um mm. a, di- a, min- a diminishment mindset rather than a, a a satisfying fulfillment whereas when i see the one who made all things then you begin to re- i don't care what it is any leaf would do and let alone an insect or a bird you can't understand the big fringe of his ways and yet the glory and beauty is there and he's given us a desire for more than we can actually name and I'm wondering, Ken, though, because so on the last episode, you talked about an impoverishment of the imagination yes. that often seizes us, or it, I would I would say infiltrates us mm-hmm. in our churches, specifically regarding what we are, as human beings are made to be, mm-hmm. and really the the beauty of human life. We tend to focus a lot in our churches, again, with the best of intentions. I want to tread carefully here. But we talk a lot about fallenness. We talk a lot about sinfulness and depravity. And what I worry about sometimes is I'll, I will, you know, do we walk out of our church services being told over and over again, your heart is relentlessly wicked, cruel, and there's nothing whatsoever you can do? Yes. Do we do we walk away with the assumption that, all right, well, I guess I, I really shouldn't do anything and if yes. i do something then yeah. i'm and it's legalism yes. i'm basically trying to play god yes. and trying to say that i'm saving myself yes so i'm wondering how to help us let's let's work through yeah. that a little bit yes because being set free from the death dealing law uh, itself and and uh, legalism and a graceless life and a lack of a vision of what we should be flourishing. What does human flourishing look like? Mm. I don't find, it seems to me, most uh, followers of Jesus even imagining what would a flourishing, fruitful, fulfilling life look like? What would it be like to be an actual manifestation of the love, joy, and peace of Christ? Uh, to be a person who manifests a contentment and a gratitude that transcends one's own circumstances, who's so winsome and so compelling that the people want that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the notion that you are actually made to be a holy person. That's correct. And that, yeah, that should, that ought to seize our imaginations. We ought to, but I think, I think many of us come to a place sometimes where we are afraid even to hope for that kind of change and get locked into this mindset of, well, no, we just need to get by, just do the minimum requirements. And this is why the way of discipleship dallas willard called this the great omission great omission right in the north american church correct but i think it starts with kind of a move of the imagination of of sort of a a radical reconceiving of the possibilities of human life and human experience and what we're made to be and we're immersed in it and we don't see it so I, as I like to say specifically to the natural world, because in general re- revelation of God, he displays his eternal power and divine nature. So we are invited in, this, in the Psalms as well, that it reveals his glory in our night, day to day, night to night, the stars. And so lose, leveraging the created order, what does it point to? It points to mystery and beauty and goodness that transcend our imagination, things that I can't even begin to know. And if I can't know, it, sometimes it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. And actually, we look now, new scientific evidence is using and is that displaying the glory of God in every order of magnitude from the microcosm to the macrocosm and our, everything we look at. So here is one whose wellspring of beauty is so creative and so awesome and uh, so compelling that you want to know that source of beauty. You want to know that source of goodness and that source of truth. The problem is that we become so logocentric that we miss out on the largely uh, important areas of the heart and the desires of the heart. It's not that we're inimical, but in my view, the beauty of God is the thing that compels me and connects mystery with goodness and truth. And, if, and so if we can begin to open our eyes to see, which is precisely what God was doing with Job, instead of answering his, his objections and his questions, he compels him to say, no, look around. Um, for me, you've, uh, I like to say that God is 
created his world in such a way that everything in the natural war world points beyond itself to, to a moral and spiritual truth for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Therefore, you need the seeing eye, the hearing ear, and few people actually have developed that capacity. Yeah, and I think of an, that you brought in another word here, mystery. Yes, mystery. That also I think is an incredibly important word and also causes a lot of people to sort of go squinty-eyed for a second yeah. sometimes. But when we think about mystery as maybe that which exceeds our full comprehension, That's not correct. something that permanently evades no. or is totally inscrutable, but a capaciousness, a kind of yes. inexhaustible An richness. Ri ri yes, the infinitude of God. And only that is big enough for us, you see. So again, if we've been created to have a relationship with the wellspring of all truth, goodness, and beauty, or as I like to now say, but beauty, goodness, and truth, um, here then I'm invited into the heart of mystery. And many theologians, very left-brained sometimes, don't want to go there because they don't want to ent entail mystery because that's something they can't control. Are you kidding me? If I spoke to you of earthly things you don't understand, how are you going to understand spiritual things? It's everything in the world is beyond our capacity, but people don't see it. Yes. So here's so here's a dark example of that yes, that yes. I've, I've come across. This comes from, not necessarily recommending this book, but this uh, comes from Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. That's a hard book to read. It's a difficult book yeah. and has probably, for my money, one of the more frightening characters in literature. Yeah, the end was, it was a hopeless tragedy. I mean, it was just the darkest end I can think of in a novel that I may have read, or just as bad as one. It's Very a hopeless, bleak. it was a bleak, hopeless despair. Uh, 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 um, basically the firm foundation of unyielding despair as Bertrand Russell described it. That's what he uh, encapsulates in that novel. Absolutely. So the character in mind, I have in mind here is Judge Holden. Yes. So he's he's really a satanic figure he as, is as the novel continues. But there's one scene, and I won't get all of, I, you know, I won't manage to capture all the, <laughs> the yeah. verbal dynamism of Cormac right, right, McCarthy's right. prose Amazing, here. yeah. Amazing. But he basically... The Judge Holden is taking samples of rocks mm -hmm. and small creatures, anything that he doesn't know. There's this one scene where they basically ask him, so, you know, this band of scalp hunters, why are you collecting all those samples? What are you doing with all those rocks? And he says, it is basically an absolute scandal that anything should evade our understanding. Whatever yes, this yes. is, it should be imprisoned in a museum. That's correct. It should... Basically, for him, this is a maneuver of dominance That's correct. and domination. That would be one of the more striking and powerful examples of the anti-mystery mindset. Oh, I think you're quite right. Mindset. Because it leads to the quest for control. Yeah. And that's we, we've talked about this in other settings, about our quest, even in, the, even in an evangelical context, to control our understanding so that we don't have mysteries. We have a nice logical theological system that, that brooks no misunderstanding. We understand the whole thing. And that's to fail to grasp that you can't understand any of this. It's, it, the, these, these truths go beyond our control, but they don't like that. So this quest for control leads to a, a, a rigid rigidity, a graceless um, uh, unforgiveness and a diminishment of the spirit that causes us to almost it, as 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 that character uh, shows us, he is actually being immersed in the dark hole, the black hole of the self, mm. and almost extinguished yeah. in the smallness of his self in this quest to control. And he realizes he can't control anything, including himself. So it seems that really, where we keep we keep returning again and again, Ken, to the notion of or the illusion, I should say, of control yes. that we're looking for. That's right. And that really does seem to be what is driving the impoverishment, it's, or at least it seems to be one very powerful factor in the impoverishment yes. of the Christian imagination often in, in the North American church is this need. And it's this is a perennial struggle of the, of the human condition, it seems, but this need to control and in a sense, to have God on our own terms. That's correct. So we want it to be under our def definition. We get to control the outcome. So that's why we know even prayers become strategy sessions between mm. ourselves and God, where we give God generous suggestions as to what our best interests look like and how to how and when to pull it off, which is nuts because we don't know what our best interests look like, but we don't want to admit that. Because yeah. if I admit two things, that I'm not in control of anything, not one day, and that secondly, I don't even know what my best interests look like. 
Right. That's a hard thing to admit. But yet I can't trust them unless I admit that. <laughs> so how do we begin to think about what sort of breaking those those deep set habits of trying to seek control yes. in our relationship with God and, yeah. and, and with others? Mm, there are many exercises I think we can e experience. And one of those, of course, will be something we don't invite, and that's going to be pain and adversity and affliction, oh, where our best uh, ploys and plots um, our planning and our manipulation always seems to fail. And we, we suppose we knew what our best interests looked like, but you'd have to be omniscient to know that. And nor, even if you did know it, you couldn't pull it off. So this recogn recognition that let loose of that crazy mm. delusion, you only God can know that. So uh, instead of understanding our role, and this is a hard one for people, people want to understand its control. He says, no, I want you to trust. Oh, and yeah. so it's a, it, you'll never understand me, but you can trust me. Mm -hmm. And that is a fatherly idea that we can have. And many people, I think, think are actually yielding the narrative of a, a youth fraught with traumatic narratives. You'll never amount to anything. How come you can't be like your brother? Yo, what do yeah. you get the B for? And those kinds of perfectionistic narratives, even now, we project them upon God and, we, and we're in our insecurity. Our best achievements are often accomplished in order to prove to a, a father who's even now dead that it, I will mm -hmm. amount to something. Mm -hmm. So ironically, given what you've, what you've said, Ken, the road to a more enriched an exalted vision of what human beings are and are capable of comes through humility. Through humility, it's always this pathway. And so we, that, since you and I love film, we can think of examples. So this remarkable film, Rain Man, you mm -hmm. remember, and you have uh, Tom Cruise is playing this wheeler dealer, thin character, all about his panache and power and prestige and possessions. And here he has this uh, older brother, Raymond, and um, and he's trying to understand how he can. He wants to yes leverage and just get the money f from the. F and it's a tragic story at the beginning, but he has to go through ag pain and agony mm -hmm. because what he wanted was actually not what he needed. And in the character arc of a good comedy, it's going to take him or the the protagonist through an, a painful arc until he discovers what he wanted was what not what he needed. And then there's a transformation through that pain to the where he treats his brother is an entirely different way. It's a it's a beautiful picture. Yes. That, but it is a comedy because it does end well. But at the same time, it is to realize that you don't control that narrative. It's out of your control. And if we're honest with ourselves, it often takes a work of art like a Rain Man or a great story yeah. to show us and bring us to that point of humility where we see, I often want something that is not at all what I need. And the only way I could have learned that is for that endeavor to crash and burn. That's right. And that and that the Lord in his mercy yes. met me in the wreckage. I know I've I have just come through a season of that in my life very, very recently. And it's been tremendously painful, but so incredibly liberating to see that the, the stronghold of pride broken there, but also to recognize that it is, the word you used was trust. Mm -hmm. And just to recognize how unbelief has a lot of really insidious ways of rearing its head. Right. And, and it's always not always directly as questioning the existence of yeah. God, that wasn't my issue. Trusting him and trusting that he knows best yes. and that his ways are not completely elusive and always completely inscrutable, but certainly exceed my full comprehension. Yes. And just getting rid of a lot of those presumptuous notions. Yeah. Yes. It was, it definitely was an ordeal, but definitely looking back, I can see how, how healing it was. And all of the, most of us who have, you know, walk with the Lord for any, any amount of time, you will go through seasons like that. Yes. And that, that path of humility will be the key to opening up a, a more grand vision for, for what the Lord actually can do yes. in a person's life. And it's the severe mercy of one who loves you more than yourself, that yes. would choose a greater good than you would choose for yourself, who would then take you through and allow you to go through that pain, even, and as I always say, God redeems what he allows, but it doesn't mm. mean it's not a difficult process. 
But in that brokenness, then you have this uh, phoenix that arises from that brokenness, that severe mercy then produces a quality, as it did in this film, where indeed, instead of Charlie using his brother Raymond, mm -hmm. um, he then wanted to serve him. He, he let, let it loose. You become other-centered. But until you let loose of this illusion that we're in control, it's the letting loose in a sense, but the embracing of a greater good. It's the embracing of the one who pursued us, wooed us, and called us, who says, you don't have anything to prove, anything, you just love me. I will take you through, this is, you're in a soul-forming world, it's not gonna be easy, but the joys and the, and the goods that you are called to pursue are so transcendent. You remember some of the things where he wants him to, uh, Raymond to, who has this, he's a, he's a autistic savant. I love to study autistic savants, by the way, because it's an intimation, parenthetically, of mm. the nature of the resurrected body. Mm. And I, so I study a lot of these. And it was actually based upon a real figure, Kim Peep, who was actually did rem memorize 7,000 books, but he couldn't understand. He could tell you what's on what page on Dostoevsky, but he doesn't understand what it is. It's a tragedy oh, of, wow. of, of knowing but not understanding. You see, it was a fullness of nothing, so that he could measure and know how many was, and he could count a six-deck shoe, remember that? Nobody can count a six-deck, he could. Yeah. And this real person did, was, a, of course, Raymond wants, he, or Charlie wants to use that and use his brother for gain. And then he discovers though, don't, and that's what he says, don't tell anyone that we're counting cards. So as he leaves, he says, what, what, they, someone sidles up to him in the bar. What are you doing here? We're counting cards. We're definitely counting cards. <laughs> His whole idea of control because this whole need for, uh, control. Mm -hmm. But then he loses this, uh, his life in a way, loses yep. his aspiration, his dream, but the end, they're closer together. And there's a richness because, in my mind, Christocentricity always brings then an other-centered dynamic. What begins with the love of God transforms me from the inside out and ends with the love of neighbor. So it becomes an altruistic and instead of a meek taking. I think most believers even are, operate from a deficiency modality hmm. of a need-oriented mindset where I need to use this person to get a sense of, oh of, of, of goodness rather than a sufficiency mindset that if I am fulfilled in Christ, I have all that I need. I don't have to, anyone to prove, and I can now serve without expecting reciprocity. Even when there's no reciprocity, it may be pain, but it doesn't destroy me because we know who we are. So having this greater vision, and that's the imagination we started with, imagining a, imagining a good that's so compelling that you'd long for it forever. But in order to do that, you have to focus on the good. And so let me bring a few more really practical remarks in on the imagination. These come courtesy of Blaise Pascal, who I think is one of the greatest modern apologists. Indeed he is. You know, and it's funny because he was writing in the 1700s and Pascal incidentally is going to say that the two great issues ever, all of us are facing are indifference and diversions. That is exactly so. And we have industries of both. And so the, the diversions, are, the man was prescient. So much so. I mean, how he, he he's writing before the smartphone, right? So that's pretty. Yeah. But he says he has this wonderful digression on the imagination. Some of the more incisive remarks I've ever seen on it. And he said, and basically he takes to task the notion that the imagination is not practical. He says, all right, you don't think the imagination is practical? Imagine what would happen, if you will, if police officers didn't have uniforms or soldiers didn't have uniforms or judges didn't have uniforms or clergy didn't have the vestments. All of those are operating powerfully on your mind and they are orienting you, they're predisposing you yes. to respond to them in a certain way. So if a, you know, a judge is in that proper regalia, there's a gravity that comes with it. Yes. So if that's true, and I think that's demonstrably true, we, we respond to the imagery that surrounds us. We yes, respond we to the language that surrounds us. What is it doing to us if the language that we're using so often in our churches is almost exclusively negative when it comes to human life and human possibility? Yes, that's right. 
yeah. is a very austere kind of vision it that's is. predisposing us in a certain direction. I think it's, that's correct. So it's, it's casting our vision too low. It's focusing on earthbound things rather than actually having a transcendent vision that then contextualizes and frames the earthbound experience. Um, as, as Pascal well understood then, the journey was so brief, so ephemeral, and his, uh, his own was tragically that. Yes. And, but at the same time, and it was a life born, he never knew a day, it seems, without pain, from what we were able to understand. That's right. But then yeah. he wears that, that wonderful memorial, remembering his doublet, that, uh, and, and he describes this day of fire, not the God of the philosophers, yes. but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. Um, and that revelation that God gave him that so impassioned him that he said there's a bigger vision and the church has succumbed to this narrow um, diminutive notion of, of a deficiency modality and an ordered attempt to control, manipulate, and empower ourselves rather than trusting the one who loved us and made us. Yeah, and I think, I mean, taking that into account, just what would... And and thank the Lord, many churches are focusing on God's goodness yes. and beauty and wonder. But this is not the story that you see on the billboard. This is not the story that you hear often. It's it is true as well. But what if we we just even focused on the fact that human human life is meant to be hallowed, that your actual your destiny as a person is you are you are made to be in union with your maker. That's what it means to have eternity in your heart. That's correct. Yeah, if we focused on that and looked at the, again, not ignoring the temptations, the, the human propensities, but if we, look, if we looked in that direction, looked at transformation and the change that is not only possible, but that you're made for, you will actually come into your own if and when this happens to you. Yes. I think that would make a major, major difference. Yes. This is why Pascal, as, as well as anyone, understood both the dignity and the depravity of the human condition. Yeah. And uh, again, that wonderful idea that the doctrines of grace, they, um, they uh, empower us, they, they give us a power without inflating us, so they elevate us without inflating us. But they also um, humble us without degrading us. And so that wonderful combination mm -hmm. that the grace of God then is calling us beyond our merit, beyond our due, to a grace-filled world of abundance rather than deficiency, that the wellspring of truth, goodness, and beauty, the one who is the lover of your soul, the one who gives himself for you, the one who becomes human. So that now, just as you are an amphibious being, a spiritual being having this earthbound embodied experience, so he too, the word becomes flesh. So what we're talking about is becoming grace filled advocates of the love of Christ who is being mediated in us and through us, but through the prism of our personality. I love that. Yeah, through the prism of our personality. That means all of the peculiarities that mm -hmm. you have, all your weirdnesses. The, all the weirdnesses, yeah. Yeah, those are the Lord the Lord will work through that and wants to use those. Yeah, we were we were just talking about this idea of this uh, an interesting notion that everyone has a flesh signature, as I describe, and conform to his image. And it is intriguing that because that is really the um, this the other side, the shadow side of various virtues. And so it might, seems to me by correspondence that everyone has a spirit image, a unique spirit signature hmm. that actually displays and reflects, reflects and refracts that glory in ways that no one else ever will. Just as if we see in his created order, no two flowers are going to be ever identical and because he have no two trees because he loves that beauty and diversity but everything reflects and refracts that glory of god but it's done in this and through it's a wonderful bigger top-down vision of a flourishing life that's a beautiful image to to conclude with thank you so much ken for having me on the show well, this has gonna, been a joy this is the beginning of many i would love to talk about wonderful things uh, things from a beauty in the arts in literature in music and in um our architecture in wonderful uh, poetry and all the things that god's granted us mm. and instead of just limiting ourselves to a fraction of this whole we are uh, we can expand to the realms of metaphysics and the realms of astronomy and the, the macrocosm the micro science and all these things i think it's the most integrated worldview and it gives us an idea of human flourishing, fecundity, fruitfulness that nothing else pr provides. God bless you. God bless you.